So welcome to today's webinar, Becoming Technical. This is the second in our three-part series. I am Abby Graff, and I'm the Vice President of Programs and Community Engagement at the Nonprofit Alliance. We also call ourselves TMPA. It's great to see so many of you here coming in the door now, both familiar TMPA members and new faces. So welcome. Um, TMPA is a membership organization. We work to promote, protect, and strengthen the nonprofit sector. Um, if you don't know us, I hope you'll visit our website to learn more about our advocacy work, as well as future conferences, educational opportunities. I can't help but plug our March fundraisers symposium. And in September, we'll have our annual leadership summit. So check us out at Tian. I'm going to say that again, tnpa.org, and we hope we'll see you today and in other places. So we're super grateful to AWS, Amazon Web Services, and Kelly Hecht for joining us to really lead this conversation and take us, guide us through this path. And then the third part of this series will be next Tuesday, and it's an interactive workshop that where we'll tackle some of your specific challenges and we'll work through the working backwards process from oh. AWS. So thank you, AWS. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you to Tina and Alan for being here. I'm going to hand it over to Kelly to take us from here. Awesome. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, I was really excited when we started on Tuesday, but I'm even more excited today because I have all of the um, great feedback and contributions from the folks on um, Tuesday's session. So um, thanks to those of you who are back for part two. Welcome to those of you who are here for your first session. Uh, we will be making a recording of both available eventually, so um, stay tuned for that in case you missed one. To give you guys um, a little context, and especially for some of the folks that are joining us for the first time today, um, I am going to start uh, by introducing myself. I'm Kelly Hecht. Um, I am with AWS, which is a division of Amazon. And within AWS, I serve on an extraordinary team of leaders that are dedicated uh, exclusively to serving the needs of the nonprofit sector. So not everyone knows that that part of AWS exists. Um, it's a really special group. And what we're really looking at are ways that technology and specifically the cloud can help nonprofit, organiza nonprofit organizations accelerate their outcomes. Sometimes that's through fundraising. Sometimes that's through efficiencies, sometimes that's through cost savings, and pretty much it's always through a multi-blended approach. Um, today, we are going to recap some of the basic definitions that we provided um, on Tuesday, just to make sure that everyone has it top of mind as we dive in, and for anyone who's new to make sure that um, they have those core definitions. And then the highlight and the majority of our time is going to be spent in conversation with Alan Gordon, who is with Save the Children and with Tina Sturkey, who is with Stop Soldier Suicide. Um, if you aren't familiar with these two leaders or their organizations, um, I'm thrilled you're gonna get to know them today. They are exceptional people. Um, and I really selected these leaders to help with this conversation today for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, they show two ends of the spectrum as it relates to sizes of orgs, which you'll hear from them about. Um, Allen's org is pretty large, um, international in scope, um, and has been around quite some time. And Tina's organization actually is quite a bit smaller, um, dare we even say just small, <laughs> and is locally based um, with some pretty ambitious goals. And they'll talk a little bit about the challenges and the benefits that come with each of that. Um, they also are leaders who bring different perspectives to the conversation today. Um, Tina will share with you her background, which is um, not emphasized in the technical sector, um, and yet she's going to speak to you today about machine learning and artificial intelligence. So not necessarily the topic you would expect from a fundraising leader of a small organization. And Alan is going to talk a lot about um, the work that they're doing around a data lake. And so um, that's a little teaser of why to stay with us. And then, as Abby mentioned, next week is going to be an extraordinary opportunity. It's not something that AWS does very often, um, so I really hope you'll be able to join. It's being led by a colleague of mine named Josh, who actually sits on a working backwards team. Um, each individual will be given a packet and a workbook, and we will literally spend the time together helping you craft a plan that works backwards from a vision or a future state or a goal that you have. Um, you will leave that session with some incredibly tangible and practical um, next steps to take. Tina and Alan have both been through those. 
um, and I think can attest it is um, a pretty transformative experience. So to be able to do it with you guys and do it in a virtual setting is really exciting. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and dive into the definitions and allow Tina and Alan to introduce themselves when we get to that part. So I joked on Tuesday, and I'll restate it. Um, it was ironic for many when um, after 20 years of serving as a marketing and fundraising leader, first at the American Cancer Society and then on the agency side, um, that I accepted a role working for the largest cloud provider globally and the most adopted cloud platform of AWS, um, mostly because a year ago I could not have answered the question, what is the cloud? And that is really what drives my passion in this role. So I accepted the role. I'm really excited for the cloud and all of its capabilities to be something that all leaders understand, not just our technical friends. So to recap, um, and I use the formal definitions because I want this language to look familiar to people when they see it in the world. Um, the cloud offers web-based delivery of IT resources and applications via the internet. Reminder from Tuesday, what we mean by that is you can access the cloud through either the web or usually an app. And it, the things that render when you arrive there are the resources and applications. So on Tuesday, we use the great example of Netflix. You go to a website or you go to your app on your iPad. You log in securely. It has your profiles, maybe your avatars there. It has incredible storage uh, resources of videos and movies and TV shows. You can live stream them from where you are. And then it'll have the recommendation engine that starts to say, if you liked this show, you might like this show. That's a great example of how the cloud is benefiting you as a consumer. And those same capabilities that are available to Netflix are available to you as the leader of a nonprofit organization. And so what we turn to on the right side of the screen is why leaders choose to adopt technology to help support their outcomes and specifically the cloud. The first is there can be significant savings. Um, you heard the analogy on Tuesday that the cloud is a lot like electricity. You pay for what you use. So Tina being a smaller organization, uh, representing a smaller organization than Alan, um, pays differently than Alan does for those the scale and scope that he needs. And that scalability is really what allows you to uh, utilize the cloud in a way that aligns with your needs and with your budgets. The ability to scale is not just specific to cost. It is also the ability to expand and contrast what you're offering and how much of it you're offering. So again, last Tuesday, we used the example of Giving Tuesday. Um, and calendar year end fundraising, where most organizations scale a little broader, a little wider, opening up the aperture to allow for more generosity to come through their digital doors on those important days. Whereas an average Tuesday in March, you might not need quite such a wide aperture, right? And so your ability to open and close as needed is, is nearly real time. And then lastly, we're continuing to see adoption be a huge driver of superior experiences. And that can be for members, donors, mission recipients. We have an incredible number of today's leading agency partners on the phone today. I'm so thrilled to see that. Um, and for your customers, this is an incredibly important piece because we are all trying to find ways to stay relevant and competitive in an, an environment that's becoming more and more complicated. And so making sure that we're utilizing technology in the cloud to do that with elements like personalization and automation, you're gonna hear Alan talk a little bit about that later, um, is extremely important. So that grounds us in the basics of what the cloud is. Hopefully that was uh, familiar to those of you that were there on Tuesday. As a reminder, the reason that we are engaging agency leaders and non-technical line of business owners is because we want each of you to be familiar enough with the workings so that you can be your own best advocates. This allows you to ask better questions of your IT team. It also allows you to um, advocate for needs that you may have. And similarly, it prevents some of that proverbial shiny object syndrome from getting in the way when we're trying to do the foundational work that our organizations need to continue to thrive. I extracted a few great um, shares. If you were on the call on Tuesday, I would love you to drop into the chat some of the things you took away, but these were a couple of my favorites. Um, when we were talking to Rich from Share Our Strength, he was sharing that IT stands for Information Technology. 
And he was really encouraging people to focus on the information part, not just the technology part, right? What information can we access through technology? And then another leap he took was what information do you need from your IT partners? And what information do your IT partners need from you? That dialogue is really important. Um, another share was uh, helping your organization shift from a scarcity mindset to an optimization mindset, which is to say, how are we going to work faster, better, more efficiently? How are we going to do the proverbial less, uh, more with less in a way that will help us grow and remain, again, competitive and relevant? Rich shared the uh, three questions that he offers when considering technology and tools that are currently in your stack. I added one before. Um, this is when that great analogy was made that if you consider technology an employee, is there any pieces of technology that's sitting in the corner with their back to the room not doing anything? <laughs> Let's evaluate those guys and see if we can bring them back into the game. And conversely, are there people out there that are working hard, um, walking from point A to point B when we could be using a car to get there a lot faster, right? So those were two analogies that, that Rich used. We talked a lot and we'll hear from Alan on this today about how a data lake can actually help you grow and cleanse your data organically. And when you do it with purpose so that it doesn't become the data swamp that Rich talked about, um, it can be really powerful. And, and Alan's got some good analogies he's gonna share with that today. And then lastly was the quote that um, Rich shared from his mentor many years ago, which is that spending time on getting the question right, or another statement there is getting the, the question about the problem right, will make the answer a lot easier. So looking forward to, uh, to reading some of the folks' uh, feedback in the chat, and we'll share that afterwards as well. Okay, last two definitions before we invite our our friends to start sharing because these are the two topics they're going to speak to. So Data Lake, Alan, wave, smile, say hi to the group. He's going to be our representative on the topic today. Um, a Data Lake, again, formal definition, allows you to store all your structured and unstructured data in one centralized repository at any scale. With a Data Lake, you can store your data as it is without having to first structure the data based on potential questions you may have for the future. So as a reminder, structure just means it's all in one single format. That's when you use more of a data warehouse. Unstructured data means it might be in different file formats, there might be different fields available, um, and it doesn't look quite as clean and organized. You may remember for those that were there on Tuesday, Rich shared the analogy of a data lake and all the streams that could flow into it. We talked about the fact that a data lake does not have to have every source of data involved. You can start with two, maybe add a third, work your way into it, and that your data does not have to have perfect hygiene because we never will before it goes into the data lake. In fact, the data lake can be a great tool to help you get better hygiene around your data. Then we're gonna hear from Tina, wave, smile, say hello, <laughs> around machine learning, which is an application of AI, um, artificial intelligence, which uh, Stop Soldier Suicide is utilizing. The official definition is the science of developing algorithms and statistical models that a computer system uses to perform tasks without explicit instructions, relying on patterns and inference instead, okay? So again, this is an example of how can it digest large amounts of information faster than the eye can, better than the human can, and coalesce and extract trends in a way that allow you to take proactive action or allow you to form some hypotheses. A prerequisite to sort of machine learning is that AI piece, which we talked about, which is the ability to identify things in a way that the human eye normally would but having the machine do it for you. And, and Tina's gonna talk about a couple different reasons that that is really important. So hopefully that is familiar to everyone. And if you weren't with us on Tuesday, I hope that that um, gives you a, a good grounding. I am gonna go ahead and stop sharing my computer now so that we can see your guys' faces. And I'm gonna ask Alan to go ahead and take yourself off mute. We're gonna start with the data lake because it's usually the best place to start. Um, tell us a little bit first about yourself and what led you to be the head of business intelligence and data analytics and integration at Save the Children. Uh-oh, we got you maybe on mute. 
there we go. Is there that we good? Go. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's been a really amazing journey. Um, over the past 20 years, I have worked exclusively in the nonprofit sector, working for mission-driven organizations in the capacity of a data architect, engineer, and business intelligence developer. Um, and over time, as my, my love for data grew over the past 20 plus years, there has been immense opportunity to really help organizations transform and start to understand the value of data. We're shifting in a period where we're going from outputs, which is that quantitative, into mm -hmm. outcomes and impact, which yeah. is that qualitative piece. Business intelligence is probably mm -hmm. my pen chant. Um, I love it because there is no shortage of data and there is no shortage of insights, but actionable insights is really at the core that drives our missions forward. It enables fundraising teams, it enables executive teams, program teams, drives thought leadership in a lot of ways. But data really is the nucleus here as we start to as we start to really peel back the layers as a, as a fundamental part of our strategy. Um, Save the Children, just by way of introduction, Save the Children, we are over 100 years old. <laughs> we are the first global movement for children and boldly declaring that children have rights. We are a federated organization of 30 plus members. And I mentioned th federated because we Save the Children in the US. We are big. Many groups here today may be smaller. We have members that are smaller. So we are pretty much across the scale between large and small, ranging from big budgets to small budgets, from large staff to merely no staff. And we are championing the rights of over 2.3 billion children in the world today. We are firmly grounded in belief that children should have a healthy start to life. They should have <clears throat> opportunities to learn and also be protected from harm. And it's, it's such a beautiful intersection when you're able to bring your passion for, for such a valuable thing as data to a mission as Save the mm -hmm. Children and where the two get to intersect and make a positive difference in the world. It's amazing. Um, your mission is extraordinary. It's also very diverse. Um, it's, it's nice to have the umbrella of children, but for those who don't know Save the Children, when you unpack where they're really present and the types of programs and services they offer, it's extraordinarily complex. Um, and I say that as a compliment to you, Alan, and to the organization. Um, it also means that you're dealing with a legacy organization, a hundred years old, right? So there's lots of muscle memory there. Also lots of data, um, probably not all perfect and clean would be my guess. <laughs> and a federated organization, which, um, Tina and I both have quite a bit of direct experience with as well. And there's a lot of tension in those environments, right? Because whose donor is it? Whose constituent is it? Well, we we like to pretend that that's not a conversation that's had it. It does come up quite a bit when it comes to data governance and things of that nature. So I share all of that as sort of stating the obvious that the undertaking of the creation of a data lake is probably not a small decision. Um, or one that was made without a lot of debate and discussion. So can you talk to us a little bit about what led the team to go ahead and start to initiate those conversations and then ultimately how those conversations led to your decision to advance the creation of a data lake in support of your business? Absolutely. In light of the mission, when a critical crisis hits, such as Ukraine and Afghanistan, we have to be very flexible and we need to be able to get to data-driven insights quickly. One thing that really stood out is that as you start to look at traditional applications, such as a, main, as a mainframe CRM, an eCRM, a financial ERP, our data is held hostage in these systems. The level of reporting and insights we can get out of them is really heavily dependent on front end query tools, on being able to pull things through rough SQL extracts from the back end. And for those who don't know SQL, SQL <laughs> is a very powerful query tool that enables you to get a, to get more advanced data from the back end of a system. But it doesn't solve what a data lake can actually do for you. 
as we started to really approach this, we knew that we needed to get our data out of these systems and so that we could start to do more advanced analysis. As that data exists in the systems, for many front-end fundraisers and marketers, you, can, you are probably all very um, keen to the fact that on the front-end, you might have to pull 20 queries to get to one KPI and try to get to the agreement across multiple stakeholders across one indicator. That's a lot of work. That is where the data lake, the power of the data lake comes in, where you can pull the data out of the application. You can start to make a lot of these, you can start to make a lot of connections to disjointed data because of the way the data is structured in applications. Data lakes, they offer, they offer the opportunity to open up that ecosystem so that you can start to look at things from a very different vantage point coupled with business intelligence tools, visualization, it's very powerful what a data lake can do. One of the, um, ben one of the key benefits of a data lake is the transformation. And I say transformation is because data as it exists in an application has a very rigid structure. What you get out of that front end application is limited. Data in a data lake has really robust query functionality. And really it's once you have that set up in your data lake, you can really harness all of the tools that come inherently built in data lake. Data lakes have evolved significantly over the past, even looking back past year and five years where we've gone from traditional data warehouses to data lakes and now to looking at data lake houses, which is really taking the best of both the data lakes and warehouses Tools are constantly evolving and data right. lakes are constantly evolving. So um, so there's so many things that are going through my head. First of all, I love to hear a technical person because I'm, I'm going to put the technical hat on you, Alan. You've used lots of terms there that, that have outed you as a technical leader. Um, <laughs> you lost me at SQL. Yeah, he used SQL. He knows what that is, right? Um, I, I think first and foremost, you use the word allowing data to empower, right? I love that because I think empowerment and we all know data can do it, but I think many people feel like they aren't empowered to use their data as much as they can. And I, I'll be candid and use myself as an example. I often couldn't access the data I wanted and needed in the way that I did when I was on the customer side. And when I was on the agency side, I struggled on behalf of my customers to get them the view of their data that they often needed and wanted to allow me to achieve the outcomes that they were entrusting me to help lead through, right? So thank you for being an IT leader. And we're going to circle back to some advice that you may have on the way that people can um, engage their IT partners um, under that premise of, of empowerment. The other thing that you shared um, there is sort of the real-time insights piece. And I think that is something that we all struggle with. I, I want to invite you to clarify a couple things for us. So this idea of our data being sort of captured by the apps, right? And that we want to free the data so that we can all use it and access it. Again, you need to hear a, a, a technology leader, an IT leader um, share that same perspective, right? Tell us a little bit more about how is a data lake in your experience and the reason you're advancing it um, for Save the Children, it's not an app, right? It's not capturing your data, but help all the leaders on the phone today understand the real distinction there. Because I think sometimes people view, they hear words like it's unstructured and you can put it all in. And then their point is, is like, well, then how do I find what I'm looking for? Then how can I use that data if I've just thrown all this information in in an unstructured format? Can you help create some color around that to, to guide the conversation for the group? Yeah. So one of the thing, one of the key activities is as you're starting to really look at these data sources, one of the benefits of the data of a data lake is that it can be structured or it can be unstructured. And you have the ability to transform that data and make it workable and make it queryable. So at, at, from the application standpoint, you're only getting the data that is available in the application. And I bring this up in transformation because one of the key components for marketers and fundraisers is the ability to also ingest additional data 
that doesn't live within your system. Great point, third party, right? Really third helpful. Third party data, absolutely. Data enrichment is one of the most important activities because your ability as fundraisers, marketers, or working within an agency where you're delivering transformational strategy for nonprofits as partners, you really have to put that information in the hands of the fundraisers and marketers because their strategy and with, with how they engage supporters, prospects, leads, is really highly dependent on the enriched data that they're receiving from third parties, that they're really continuing to evolve, whether it's psychographic, such as, you know, understanding people, understanding gender, understanding age, being able to build personas as you start to look at this data so you can effectively communicate with your supporters and your prospects. All of the data that's readily available to you, whether it's through, whether it's through third party services that append your data, these things are so important because we need actionable insights that really help us understand not just the psychology behind our donors, supporters, prospects, and leads, but how we can understand what the propensity is. Capacity is always that high, is, is always the, I think the lowest hanging fruit because we're big <laughs> yeah. dollars. And what we know through time is that capacity actually has nothing to do with it. Donors are coming in at lower thresholds. They want to test the waters. They want to understand your mission. And insights that you get from these enriched services that can be ingested into your data lake because your CRM also should not be the place where all of this lives. Yeah. Your CRMs, one of the other misconceptions about a CRM is that it is the source of truth. We're going to push everything into a CRM. Data lakes is really where you should be storing a lot of this rich information because it's not part of a minimum viable record. It's when you start to look at the context of what a CRM can produce versus a data lake, your data lake is really where the power comes from, from the analytics and the engagement perspective, as you really start to understand the psychology of these people you're engaging with as well. I love this. So it's really great. And if I can paraphrase and tell me if I'm if I'm misstating it, right? We all need and use CRMs. Those aren't going anywhere, right? But the data lake is something that allows us to put multiple sources of data together in a way that might get a little bit messy for a minute, allows us to extract what the information is really valuable to moving forward. And then we can naturally start to bring just those pieces of information back into our CRM so that we're constantly working from a place of the richest and most accurate and most valuable data. Is that a, a, an accurate restatement? Absolutely. Awesome. And I think, you know, for many fundraisers and marketers who have received these types of files and appends where you yeah. have 100 columns going across, and out of the 100 columns, you might only deem two or three really important. You can push all of that into your data lake, and maybe there's value for other teams, for other pieces of information that has been returned, yeah. but your data lake is really your analytical backbone to mm. really glean those insights that might not have immediate need for one team, but could be completely instrumental for another. And so the data lake really expands your realm of opportunity that crosses multiple divisions mm -hmm. with ever-changing business needs and insights. It, it's a great point. That that one, guys, if you didn't write that down, Data Lake is the analytical backbone of your organization. That is like a, my mind just exploded. I love that quote. Um, and I also love, and you shared this when we were talking in advance of today, this concept of a minimum viable record, right? Um, I certainly was was grown up I grew up in the, the days where we did try to have a CRM be all things to all departments and all teams and single source of truth. And it's no wonder we were hitting our heads against a wall, right? This concept of a minimum viable record, talk a little bit more about what that means to you and how it relates to the relationship between a data lake and a CRM. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I think this group will really understand the, the value of what a minimum viable record <laughs> is because we're all after data. We all want to engage with active leads. We, wanna all, we all want to engage with prospects, but oftentimes we don't have the key criteria for what constitutes a minimum viable record. And I'm going to highlight the, a edge case that is very pertinent 
Most of the time, organizations have first name and an email address. What good does that do to have a record that could potentially already exist in your system of an individual who might have an address that does not have an email address where you're importing duplicate records? A minimum viable record sets a standard for what is acceptable to live in a CRM that has derived an intentional business value. Mm -hmm. So you really start to intentionally lay out the definition where your data lake becomes where you store all of your information that does not meet the criteria for a minimum viable record or a trigger to put it into your system. CRMs oftentimes become, and I'm gonna say this with, um, I'm gonna try to say this as gracefully as possible, they become a dumping ground. Yeah, and a swamp. It can be, it can be <laughs> And garbage in ends up being garbage out. Mm -hmm. When you start to inflate the amount of data you push into your CRM, it has implications for how your CRM performs. Sure. How many, I, I'm curious how many people have, when you first go live in a solution and queries are really fast and you get data in like a minute and records pull up really fast. Oh, and it's so lovely when that happens. <laughs> years down the road, all of a sudden performance slows down. It's because people treat their CRMs as a dumping ground for all records that do not meet that threshold for minimum viable record. So as you start to think of your data lake, you can design rules in your data lake that says this individual is this individual exists in our data lake. We now have information on where they live, their address, which is part of a criteria of a minimum viable record. We now have mailing address. They have taken X amount of actions. They should be triggered to create a record in CRM. Yep. That is, these are types of things that you need to think about as you're starting to create the minimum viable record. But also, this is how you can leverage your data lake as well. And you can start to look at your investments. Leads is in the nonprofit industry. The I think the leads was one of the most quickly growing area for potential for revenue expansion. Mm -hmm. And leads oftentimes comes in very minimal formats where you might not even be getting a first name or a last name, just an email address. Yeah. And when you're working with just an email address, you're not, you don't have a lot to work with. Your data lake could be the repository that you store that information until you get additional insights right. and you're able to create that role. I'm a, it's great context. I'm going to clarify a couple of things because I see some really important questions coming through in the chat. So thank you guys for putting that in there. So a couple of things um, that I want to summarize here. A minimum viable record is not a one size fits all. Alan can't tell you what yours should be and what yours should be shouldn't be what the person um, ahead of you in the queue should be, right? So I think it's really about distilling down for your business, for your organization, or if you're on the agency side for each of your customers, what are the pieces of data, keeping it as, as lean as you can to start, that are really essential for you delivering on mission and the customer constituent experience in the way that you need to, right? <clears throat> so to Alan's point, first name, last name, email, might be a place that you choose to start, but there's usually something more like connection to mission, right? Or role or source of acquisition. Did they come in through a peer-to-peer -peer gift or did they come in through a volunteer engagement? There's usually at least <clears throat> one more element, what city or state they live in. So I think that's a good dialogue to have and I would really um, encourage people to have that conversation and that discussion with a matrix team that reflects different um, groups within your organization to start to define where you might wanna start there. Mm -hmm. And then to Alan's point, it doesn't say you don't collect the other information or that you don't even activate around it. You might have thousands of records where you have first name and email and your minimum viable record criteria may be more than those two data points you can still use an email and you can still email them, right? You just might do so by pulling from the data lake to your automated marketing tool and not necessarily doing it through your CRM creation. So there's lots of flexibility here in the way that you can use the data lake to support business outcomes. It's not just a, a one size fits all, which begs the question, Alan, as someone who is leading a very complex um, initiative for a, a large scale organization, this is an area where there seems to be a lot of fear. 
a lot of organizations have resisted data lakes or have said they don't need a data lake because they have a data warehouse or have continued to try to advance the CRM as the single source of truth in a way that doesn't feel like it's meeting all the needs of at least some of the leaders on this call. Can you talk a little bit about what might be driving that fear and give some, some thoughts around how to help work through it before we transition and hear a little from Tina? Yeah, um, I, I think CRM is, is usually the primary driver here because there is a lot of comfort around the ability to access a CRM through a front end web portal. And it's the unknown that really is the challenge here. As people start to think about data lakes and these more ambiguous concepts around data, it's the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. People want to be able to access data at their fingertips. Not really, and I think that we have to really clarify that what we're getting from a front end system versus what you're getting from a data lake and really starting to empower your teams to really start to do um, an in-depth SWOT analysis. That's where we started as well. We started working closely with our marketing teams, our fundraising teams, and started to look at a detailed SWOT. And what is the difference between CRM, leading business conversations? And there was a really good, we have a really strong buy-in um, from the, we it Save the Children. We had a really strong buy-in, fortunately, um, coming into this role around the need for data lakes, but it was refining mm. what data lake is. Great point. We were starting to clarify it. People understood that we needed it, but they didn't understand why. People and really starting to highlight, I think some of the, and one of the things is really highlighting what the vast difference is between CRM and data lake. I think you really have to highlight those differences. Right. Once people can start to really see the distinction between the two, data lakes aren't replacing CRMs and CRMs are not replacing data lakes. Both are here. But when you leverage and, and harness the power of both together, that is really going to set really you up amazing. Long, in the long run. Awesome. Okay, so as we as we press pause on our data lake conversation, we encourage everyone on the call, do not march into IT and demand a data lake. That is not the takeaway today, tisk tisk. But hopefully everyone feels a little bit more knowledgeable and maybe even if not knowledgeable, just a little more curious around a data lake. You might even have one and you don't even know it, right? That's often the case. I'm amazed at how many of my fundraising friends I talk to that are using AWS for a data lake and didn't even know they were. So here's an opportunity to uh, take your, your head of IT to lunch, um, and learn, hear what you have, hear what you don't have, hear why they structured it that way. And hopefully you have some language to ask some new questions and start to think through how some of those solutions may be applicable to your world. So thank you very much, Alan. Tina, I'm gonna invite you to take yourself off mute so that we can switch to the topic of machine learning, which I love. It has always sounded very sci-fi to me, right? AI and machine learning, and it often gets a bad rap because people like to think of it as, you know, some evil robot taking charge of our donors and doing things we don't want it to do. So let's dispel that myth today with um, some extraordinary real life applications that you're seeing. Um, but let's start by hearing about you. Um, how did you come into your role um, as the chief growth officer, which I love for Stop Soldier Suicide? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Great. Uh, I have similarly worked in my uh, career my entire career in nonprofit. It's been an amazing journey. It was with the American Cancer Society starting right out of college and grew with that organization. Absolutely loved growing with the emergence of digital marketing. And so really spent a lot of time and effort in digital marketing and digital fundraising. And um, as I met the founders at Stop Soldier Suicide almost four years ago, I was really intrigued by one, just it, in general, the mental health conversations in our in our country and, and how we're taking that forward and how they uh, unduly affect the veterans and service members that have served our country, but also their really innovative approach to what's the problem that we're trying to solve? What is it that we're really focused on here? Is it um, to save lives? Uh, yes. Uh, is it to save lives forever? No, because we actually want to get to the root cause and the root cause of the problem so that we can chart a different path um, and so that we can find out why this is happening and we can start to 
prevent it from happening much further upstream once we have new insights. So just like Alan said, there's there's information and then there's insights. There is a lot of information in the space, uh, much, much, much um, research over decades about uh, suicide and specifically veteran suicide and mental health in general, and the field has advanced tremendously. Um, but in many cases, there's not enough insight into what is the underlying issue that we need to solve to prevent this from perpetrating forevermore. Um, and I was just so excited to come jo join this organization to say that sounds ex like something I wanna go work on. Um, and to your point earlier, we're young and fresh. Our founders are army veterans that started this organization 12 years ago because they lost friends and um, loved ones of their own to suicide and just thought there, there must be a better way. Mm -hmm. And so as a fresh and young organization, you know, growing pretty rapidly over the last 12 years, I've had the joy of getting to build out, um, you know, what the growth path looks like with uh, but that primary background of development and marketing. Um, how are we taking development and marketing um, best practices that are, have been in place for decades in the nonprofit community and overlaying that with thinking differently and, and a really innovative approach, not just to growing the revenue and the brand, but also to uh, solving mission problems and um, putting all those things together it, at, in a new path and charting a new path. And that's really how we got involved with AWS a couple of years ago and specifically an ML project that we're working on called Black Box Project. Awesome. I love the name Black Box Project too. So um, what struck me when I first heard about the work um, that Stop Soldier Suicide was doing was um, in, in my experience, there's organizations that are much larger than you that are focused on serving the veteran community um, that have been serving the veteran community for many more years and within their efforts um, have been been aware of and concerned about and aiming to um, prevent suicide as part of their support of that community. Um, so here you are, a younger, smaller, right? Um, less data, less brand awareness, um, probably smaller budgets. How did you guys come to determine that machine learning could be part of your solution? How did you even allow yourselves to think of something that is often associated with a bigger, more robust, and more um, more uh, broadly funded, shall we say, type organization. Yeah, uh, I think it, you know it. It it simply comes down to, if I could summarize it, is is the old phrase of um, "work smarter, not harder." Right. If if we do have a small budget and we are a young organization and we're growing fast and we're trying to solve this problem that's frankly been a problem for a very long time and ha we haven't made a lot of progress as a as a society, there's got to be a better way. And just asking that question, what what else hasn't been thought of, or what else is um, you know new technology, insight, innovation in the marketplace that maybe the um, organizations that have been around a lot longer are not yet utilizing or have not yet put in place. And um, uh, an amazing veteran, uh, we had some conversations a couple of years ago, came to us uh, after having lost his uh, best friend to suicide. And he'd also worked in digital forensics. And so he understood the, um, the, the, the really the unleashing of technology against a a focused problem the power that exists in that and so we started having these conversations he's now uh, the the lead uh technologist on this project black box project but we started having these conversations that said what if we could uncover never before known insights about the days weeks hours leading up to suicide loss there is a tremendous amount, like I said, of research in the field. There's a tremendous amount of uh, mental health understanding about how we treat crisis. Um, and yet there's this question that kept coming up time and time again, which is, you know, we would hear of a suicide loss and we would say, and, and may, many of you maybe that are watching, maybe thinking about some, some well-known um, suicides that have happened uh, even very recently, and everyone is faced with this question of, but I, but I don't understand. I just saw, I just saw that person. They seemed okay, and so there's always been this disconnect, right? Like we, we look out for the people we care about, and we're watching around corners, and we think that people are okay, and then somehow they're not. So 
um, when we think and we put those two things together, how do we take an innovative approach and the new technology and overlay that with the problem set? Um, we decided that we were going to try to uncover um, what we can learn from a digital device of a loved one who has died by suicide. And when we think about the loved ones that have died by suicide, we, if we if we take the, the patterns that a digital device have, if you think about our own personal behavior today, there are incredible amounts of things that our digital devices have. We carry them around with us all day, every day. They know our sleep patterns. They know what text messages we've sent. They know who's called us and who hasn't. They know our physical geolocation, all of these things, right? And um, what's, what's sort of key to this is that there's an uncovering of information that could be different for every single person. So Kelly, your phone and my phone and Alan, your phone, when we were to take a look at what we've done in the last 24 hours, those could not be more different. <laughs> but they're, right, they're, there's got to be in some way, shape or form correlates for those that have gone down a certain path, uh, you know, the path that we're looking at, which is dying by suicide. So how do we then use technology, this innovative approach of machine learning to pair data points together and start to say like, we with the human eye, this could take us decades to try to scrape through and understand and do um, traditional things like psych autopsies, which are talking to a family member after a, a loved one has passed and uncovering what they were doing in the days, weeks and, and months leading up. But if we can yet get, machine learning to start to correlate data points and do that in an accelerated fashion, there could be things that come together that no none of us have ever known. And it goes back to that question of, you know, I, I just saw that person the other day and I thought they were okay and yet they died by suicide. So there's something else underneath of there. Um, so it got really exciting. It was like, okay, well, how do we do that? <laughs> like, that sounds like a great idea. How do we actually make that happen? And I think, you know, what, what I love about this organization and about our approach is that it, you just, we just, you just have to start. You have to start small. We didn't have to, we didn't say we have to bring our entire infrastructure over. We have to have thousands of devices. We have to have, we were like, can we get a device? Can we get a single device? Can we get a family member to say, because my I, I lost my loved one, I don't want anyone else to lose their loved one. So yes, you can take my loved one's device and um, see what was on it. Mm. And when we started that small, it gave us this um, this you know proof of concept that we could do the the just the next step and just the next step and just the next step. Um, and so we've been doing it for about a year, a little year and a half. It's it's really exciting to see it start to come together and. Um, we are already starting to see insights. Either they're brand new insights or they're data points that support a, a hypothesis that we had mm. that let us just keep going down that path. Really powerful. There's so many things that strike me as I listen to you talk and I've, I've read about this and I participated in this and yet every time I hear about it, I feel like I uncover something new. So thank you, Tina, for sharing. Um, I'm struck first and foremost by your comment of we asked. Right. I think that is often where we stop. Right. We're in a room, we have an idea and we think, oh, that won't work because it's like we talk ourselves out of it before we even realize that it was an idea. Right. Where someone else does. So I love the A just to start with that basic. You asked. Right. Could a machine do this for us? Is that even possible? Um, that was a big takeaway for me and what I just heard you say. Another thing that I really love is this concept of um, we've heard the, the phrase smart or not harder a lot. But I think where I really see it in this particular case is using machines for things that they're uniquely qualified for mm -hmm. and saving the humans for the things that they're uniquely qualified for, right? So um, yes, you could interview a family member, which is, I have to imagine, incredibly traumatic for a family member to go through. It's also incredibly time-consuming and also very subjective because what they share and what you hear Right. has a lot of influence on it, right? So when we give that to a machine, they can work faster. The machine is not traumatized by what it has to digest, right? right? And it removes the subjectivity element, which then frees up your team to work on the human connection and support, which I really just celebrate because um, that's so important for the loved ones who are survived by um, their, their family member and friends who have died by suicide. So love that call out. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the concept here of machine learning, because I think you you touched on something else that's really worth highlighting. Alan talked a lot about it from more of an infrastructure perspective, right? The data lake 
is sort of the underpinning or the foundation of an organization. It's used by almost every department, right? Marketing can utilize elements from a data lake. Um, fundraising certainly can. Field ops can. Business planning can all the way through, right? But you're using the cloud and specifically machine learning for more of a project. So regardless of where your infrastructure is, which you know is another topic for another time because there's lots of different things we could discuss there, you focused on something specifically. I'd love to hear a conversation or hear your thoughts around how that came to be too. Was there resistance? Was there a misunderstanding that you had to, to your point, move everything to the cloud? Or did people sort of understand and embrace that early on? Um, we, it, we really, it was, it was, it was such a uh, transition for me to go from an organization, like you said, a, a legacy organization that's been, um, you know, moving this gigantic infrastructure for years and years and really thinking about how we're solving problems at scale um, to the sort of um, flexibility that you have and the agility that you have as a small organization to test things small. And um, so that was, you know, we, we really have a very entrepreneurial culture internally in that we don't feel that we need to make a decision today that is the decision that's for the next three years, that's the entire infrastructure, that's the entire, you know, moving an entire CRM or whatever. It's how do we test this as small as possible, as quickly as possible to give us that proof of concept and get to the next step. And that's also a de-risking um, uh, really strategy, right? So as a chief growth officer, I have to drive forward the financial sustainability of this organization. So when you do have smaller budgets, every dollar matters. I believe I believe every dollar matters in the bigger organizations too. But when you do have small budgets, you're really trying to say like, if I have this, you know, these $100, I can apply these $100 to A, B, or C, and we have to rank prioritize those things all the time. So we really have this entrepreneurial and sort of agile methodology mindset all the time that allows us to um, make decisions like this. So there was hesitation, yes, because it's it's a scary, like, can we actually do this like project? And so how do we decide what's the first thing we do? And how do we decide what's the second thing we do? But there wasn't pushback. It was It was more of a, how do we we know that this could be powerful, but how do we take the first step? And, and that's frankly where we engaged with partners like AWS. Like you guys were such great advisors to us to say, no, you don't have to have a thousand devices. We could start with one and then we can get to 10 and then we can get to a hundred, right? We were like, ah, you can almost feel like your shoulders relax. Like, okay. <laughs> like, yes, we could do that small. Um, and so those are some of the decisions that were made along the way and how we mitigated that um, to de-risk for the organization. It's a great point. And it, it's interesting because that is one area that both of you guys have in common, right? A misperception around a data lake is that you have to have all your data sources feed into it. We, we dispelled that with Rich yesterday and Alan validated today. A myth around machine learning is I have to have a ton of data in order to start, right? No, you can start with two phones, right? You can see if there is a single correlated element between two phones and maybe there's one. Maybe there's 10, maybe there's none, right? But that's how you start the journey. And I think that's such a beautiful thing because innovation is, uh, is often described as this like big, shiny object, right? But that is innovation. Innovation is just taking one step at a time towards something that you wonder about, that you're curious about, that might explore a new insight and, and to see where that leads you. So thank you, Tina. I also... Um, have to celebrate that um, Tina's team did something else that was awesome, which was that they applied for a grant um, that AWS offers every year called the Imagine Grant. Um, and they, they are a second year, I think, award winner this year. And um, Save the Children is this year as well. Um, if you aren't familiar with the Imagine program, it's one of several uh, that is a granting part of the AWS for Nonprofits team. There's also an awesome conference in March if you're going to be in D.C. for the TMPA one or the day before. So good timing, good week to be in D.C. Um, both of those are really amazing. And congratulations, Tina, for taking that first step, for utilizing some funding to support it. And to Alan um, and Tina both, thank you so much for joining us today. Before everyone signs off, um, I do want to just, um, again, thank Abby and the TMPA team for facilitating this conversation. I really want to thank everyone for joining. So, Tina and Alan, I cannot thank you both enough. What you are doing is extraordinary for your missions and for this industry. And Abby, I will turn it back to you with uh, gratitude from the AWS for Nonprofits team, too. 
Well, I will just pile on more gratitude and appreciation for your generosity and sharing all your experiences, stories, insights, and remembering what it's like to be a non-technical person and putting it in terms that help us onboard ourselves further into this technical world that is emerging. So thank you everyone for being here.